Sonic, Sonic, Sonic. Sonic this and Sonic that. Sonic, Sonic, Sonic game transition, game over Sonic. And then occasionally, you get that one guy who talks about Super Monkey Ball. Nerd. Meanwhile, it seems like every Nintendo franchise is a topic of constant discussion. There's, of course, Mario, Zelda, Metroid, Fire Emblem, Pikmin. People even sit there and say they want a new Ice Climbers game. I mean, come on, you really want a sequel to this? Sega wasn't always a one-trick hedgehog, though. In the 90s and early 2000s, Sega had probably just as many franchises as Nintendo. The difference is that most of them were very short-lived or forgotten by history, at least by the general public, that is. There will always be the devoted online communities who remember and cherish these games forever, and there will always be a few people who knock over old ladies on Black Friday to buy a new Alex Kidd game. Probably, there's someone out there like that. These forgotten Sega franchises range from series like Puyo Puyo, which aren't that forgotten. They maintained a cult following, and it still receives decent success on platforms like the Nintendo Switch. And then there's series like Samba de Amigo. It only had a few games, but a decent enough lifespan on multiple generations of consoles. And recently, it seems like a lot of forgotten Sega series have been getting rebooted or remastered left or right. There's Alex Kidd, there's Shenmue, Crazy Taxi, just to name a few, and the list actually does go on. Some of these revivals receive full-blown games, and some unfortunately just receive a crappy mobile game adaptation that only further hurts the legacy of their franchise. But amidst the good and bad, there's one Sega series that seems to exist almost under the radar, only releasing a handful of games in a span of a few years, and this is none other than Jet Set Radio. Jet Set Radio! <laughs> Jet Set Radio is an anomaly to me in terms of video game franchises. Most of the time when a series is so short-lived, you'd expect it to have been not very good and not very memorable. All I'm saying is there's a reason we didn't get five big rigs games. Regardless, there's plenty of franchises that are artistically inadequate but maintain a relevant shelf life and lifespan as a series nonetheless. To tie things back to Sonic, the franchise has had a large amount of bad games as far back as Shadow the Hedgehog. but still receives installment after installment, and probably always will. But the crazy part about Jet Set Radio is, this game is mostly universally praised, getting 9s and 10s across the board. Well, except for, except for Stan. So what's the missing variable here? People love the game, but only two major titles were developed. So why does Sega avoid this game like a plague? Well, the answer is unfortunately predictable and simple. It didn't sell that well. Don't get me wrong, the first game did okay. Nowadays, the sales numbers are listed as over a million copies, but that's with an HD remaster and many versions on many consoles. In general, when it first came out, it underperformed to say the least and did bad in Japan, Sega's home country. It definitely didn't help that this game was released on you know, the Sega Dreamcast, which not only was selling poorly at the time, but was also on its way out as a console. The series' second and last major release, Jet Set Radio Future, which was released on Microsoft Xbox, did even worse, and this time around was a genuine commercial failure, which was probably the catalyst for the end of the franchise. I think in this case, the console that these games were released on kind of doomed their chances of success. The Dreamcast was unfortunately a commercial failure, as mentioned, and would contribute to Sega's final days as a home console titan. And while the Xbox did a little bit better, it specifically bombed in Japan, meaning that Jet Set Radio Future didn't sell that well overall, but especially didn't sell well in Japan. And when it doesn't sell well in a home country, game companies do take note on that. The gaming industry can often be a cold and desolate place. Simply being a good video game isn't enough to keep a franchise alive. The reality is most game developers often do care about the art more than not. Video games cost a lot of money and a lot of time to produce. If a game franchise isn't going to sell, convincing a company to continue supporting it, it's often a losing battle. This is the reason why if a game company finds a money maker, they usually just end up sticking to that, which is why series such as Call of Duty, Five Nights at Freddy's, Fortnite, and Grand Theft Auto Online end up being supported the amount they do rather than new artistic endeavors and fresh IPs. And ultimately, it's why some companies will take the route of Kickstarters or Indiegogos if they want to create a spiritual successor. Shenmue 3 is a huge example of this. For many years after Shenmue 2, there remained a rampant fan base who desperately wanted to see the continuation of the Shenmue story. The original plan for the series was for the story to span seven games or something. 
So when the second game was released and the next 15 years were dead silent, a series that was specifically supposed to be a dedicated art form and storytelling medium was put on a halt due to the financial strain it would put on Sega to make a new game. When talks of a third game began, it made sense to fund it on Kickstarter, and the fans would pay for a lot of the development before it even began. This would be opposed to them making it without that and risking losing millions and millions of dollars if the fans didn't show up to support it. Point being, Jet Set Radio likely died to the fact that it wasn't commercially viable to continue making, which is ironic as because the main theme of the game is that you're supposed to be fighting against corporations and their standards. Jet Set Radio is a game which encapsulates teenage angst and the shifting trends in the youth during the late 90s about sticking it to the man and enjoying the city as a progressive rebel. But instead of vaping or eating laundry detergent pods, this game's about marking your gang's turf as much as you possibly can with spray paint in the vibrant city of Tokyo to and its surrounding locations. There's some great punk music that grandmas would vomit upon listening to, and most of the adults in this game are designed to be as excessively cruel as possible. Jet Set Radio was developed by Smilebit, a studio containing a lot of the developers who previously worked on the Panzer Dragoon franchise. Okay, so the craziest thing about this game is that before the gameplay or genre was even set in stone, the art style was considered first and foremost. But most importantly, they wanted to make a game that was easy to play and easy to understand. Perhaps the most noteworthy thing about the graphics, though, was that Jet Set Radio more or less invented their cel-shaded graphics in video games, and that's a trend that's used to this very day. I mean, look at this art style. This couldn't have been done on the N64 or the PS1. Sometimes you'd look at a texture in an N64 game and you're like, okay, this could either be a mound of crap, it could be mud, it could be bricks, it could be the Declaration of Independence. But when sixth generation consoles were on the horizon and 3D games started to resemble, you know, actual human existence, there were generally two routes a game could go. It could either try to resemble reality as much as possible, and while that would be impressive in the moment, it would look aged by comparison a few years down the line, or a game could accept it was a video game and go for a more cartoony and clear approach. Well, this sacrifices realism a bit, it leads to a visual style that often holds up to this very day. Jet Set Radio graphically aged so well. The Legend of Zelda got two releases during the sixth generation on home consoles. There was Wind Waker and Twilight Princess. Okay, which one of these two do you think aged better? Which one of these didn't look horrible in their HD remaster? Jet Set Radio is also one of the first games to include a quote-unquote open 3D world. I mean, this is kind of a stretch. People really like describing this as an innovator in this field of game design, and I can see it as a stepping stone. But really, it's not that much different than some of the open world games you'd see on the N64. Don't get me wrong, these worlds were still innovative when they were released, but I would be lying if I said this game really pushed what an open world game was in that sense. Jet Set Radio released in the year 2000, the turn of a new millennium. Remember when everyone thought computers would kill us all because of the calendars, they didn't go up to 2000? Well, I'm glad we moved past silly stuff like that as a society 20 years later. To promote the release of the game, Sega held an open graffiti competition in San Francisco, California. Prior to the release, fans were asked to send in pieces of paper with a graffiti design, and the artists behind the best pieces of art were flown out to actually paint it on a bigger canvas in person for another competition. And the art that the Sega judges, yeah, there were Sega judges, deemed the best would win $5,000. Sega paying people to break the law. Sega was the coolest of cool. Okay, it was actually technically legal, and the law that it would be breaking anyways is fairly innocent, but still, this event was a really cool marketing idea, and a really good celebration of the game. Everyone who got a design in the final competition would win a Sega Dreamcast. But the funniest part about all this is that the mayor of San Francisco, Willie Brown, was pretty pissed off about it and tried his best to get the event moved out of San Francisco. Even though it was legal, it's not like they were spray painting buildings, they were spray painting on open canvases, and Sega had the appropriate licenses to do this. Willie Brown just responded a bit too late, but he was concerned that they would say, we condemn graffiti. Sega responded by saying that it was supposed to be more of a celebration of legal art, and they also donated money to stopping illegal vandalism, so I'm not too sure what their point was. I live in California, I've been to San Francisco a few times, and it's really odd almost they try to stop this, because San Francisco is usually one of the most progressive places in modern society. If you've been there, you know that. My favorite part about this whole saga is that in Jet Set Radio, you are going up against the establishment. The boomer adults are trying to stop you, and the mayor kind of just filled that role in real life. Like, he was the one trying to stop this from happening. Like, you, you can't make this stuff up. 
But while the San Francisco mayor just wanted the promotion out of their city, there was also an entire separate council from the city of Milwaukee that advocated for Sega to literally cancel and stop production of Jet Set Radio. Oh, come on. Like, I kind of get their argument. The city was annoyed about having to pay for graffiti a lot more frequently. But how on earth is that enough reason to have Sega just not release a game that they spent million? It, 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 I don't get it. And Sega pretty much responded with, no. Boy, if they hated this game and they thought this game was a concern for the youth. These people nowadays must be furious over what's coming out. In fact, nowadays I bet they wish games were more like Jet Set Radio. It's important to note, while initially this game was titled Jet Set Radio in Japan, it was renamed to Jet Grind Radio in North America. The PAL version stayed Jet Set. And while writing the script, I struggled to decide upon what this video should be called. And I settled ultimately on calling it and referring to it Jet Set Radio and just using that name to refer to it. I think this is fair. I mean, it's the original name, more regions than not, not called it that. And the sequel was just known as Jet Set Radio Future. So I don't know, they're almost interchangeable and the first game got an HD re-release on consoles down the line, and it was Jet Set Radio there, so we're just gonna stick with that. But do keep in mind, in North America, this was Jet Grind Radio. I know, it's such a huge difference, and I probably didn't need to mention it, but there's always gonna be that one person who's confused, so there you go. I hope that one person is happy. But no, we can't end these regional differences that easily. It's more complicated than that. When the Japanese version of the game was released and they were getting ready to bring it to the other regions, they thought the primarily Japan-centric cities would be a turnoff for us slimy Americans. And I don't know, can you blame them? I mean, look at us. We have a Burger King and McDonald's five feet away from each other at every street corner. Okay, seriously, what's up with that? Why are these places always so close to each other? Like, is there a big difference between the two? Anyway, for the North American and PAL version, they designed two extra stages along with two extra characters. But also, Sega would later re-release this game in Japan under the name Dayla Jet Set Radio, which fixed some glitches and had this content, where it did okay, but still underperformed. Part of the reason this re-release even had to come to fruition in the first place is because the original Japanese version was known to be quite buggy. Yeah, nowadays when a game is bad upon release, it gets a quick patch. Back then, just ship out a whole new version. The story of Jet Set Radio is simple, charming, and maybe a tad meaningless. And you know, thank God for that. I'm so sick of games nowadays having stories that end up being way more than they can chew and it's just like this cartoony game. So the story ultimately becomes one of my favorite parts of the game because it's charming and doesn't try to be something that it shouldn't be. This game has three chapters to it. In the first chapter, you are introduced to the city of Tokyo. So you are a new teenage scumbag named Beat, who is being recruited to join a skater gang known as the GGs, while the adults and people of authority refer to you as the Rudies. Yeah, that'll 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 show them. What a what a mean nickname. The game begins with a tutorial, which is supposed to introduce you to the controls taught by GG members Gum and Tab. In this tutorial, you'll learn the basic principles of the game. You pick up paint cans while skating around the city and press the L trigger to spray graffiti on the walls. Now, I don't know what kind of legal system goes on in the city of Tokyo, but the people after you for spray painting graffiti are extreme. They come after you with countless guys with whips, shotguns, rockets, tanks, guys in jetpacks. They want you dead for spraying graffiti paint on a wall. Okay, I'm not a lawyer or anything, but I do consider myself a bit of a true crime nut. I've watched all the episodes of Jim Can't Swim, so I think I know what I'm talking about. And I think their punishment for this crime in particular, you know, you know, you know, public execution, it, it's a bit extreme. It's well known that in Japan, the youth are expected not to be a bunch of little sh** and often face higher standards than other countries. In the United States, which is where I'm gonna do my research around this scenario, because it's more accessible to me for one, and also chapter two revolves around a US city, so I think it's kind of fair game to just view that as a standard, so just just go with it, and also to be as lenient as possible, since California is pretty loosey-goosey with these things. Let's just go by Sega's real-life San Francisco event and look at California Penal Code 594 specifically, where, where vandalism is considered to be a misdemeanor meaner if the amount of damage caused is less than $400, but a felony if it's more than that. If the amount of defacement, damage, or destruction is $400 or more, vandalism is punishable by imprisonment or be put in a county jail not exceeding one year or by a fine not more than $10,000. If less than $400, vandalism is punishable by imprisonment in a county jail not exceeding one year or by a fine not more than $1,000. 
Now in this game, it's tough to say how much damage this graffiti actually causes. The amount of graffiti sprayed per wall varies. Some only require a little spray, while some of the required graffiti spans giant murals. Now let's do the math for cleaning this up. A can of paint itself costs about $10 according to walmart.com. There's probably better paint out there, so if you're a paint enthusiast, chill out. It doesn't matter. I've got this. Bye. Granted, you have to pay people to paint. It's not like someone would just do it for free. A standard rate for a painter is 2 to $6 per square foot. Uh, okay. I don't know how many square feet this is. Okay, let's say B to six foot. I asked a team of highly advanced and tactical scientists and mathematicians to calculate the... Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I, I, I evolved this, and by my perfect calculation, this ends up being about five feet by 15 feet. The final calculations come out to be 75 square feet. Let's just say it's $4 per square foot, since the range is between two and $6. The price ends up being 300, plus the $10 we had to pay for the paint can, meaning at least under US California laws, a beat would only be charge for a misdemeanor and not a felony. But wait, you are technically breaking another law by running from the police. Well, God damn it, this complicates everything. This charge is known as evading arrest on foot. And I looked it up, skateboards and roller skates are not considered to be a vehicle by most laws. Well, that's good to know if you're a criminal. This again is a fairly small charge, punishable by up to one year in county jail. However, a defense attorney might argue that in cases where the police uses illegal excessive force, it may be a defense that the arrestee acted in lawful self-defense. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I would consider running up to someone with a f***ing shotgun, rockets, whips to be illegal and excessive. So I don't know, like, yeah, you're committing a crime, but th but does this warrant being publicly executed in the streets in cold blood? You'd probably just get all these charges thrown away in court because the police are trying to murder you. If anything, these guys should be thrown in jail. Where's a good lawyer when you need one? Uh, anyways, this is, this is a professional video. Uh, where, where was I? Oh my god. Yeah, chapter one, you join the gang, you learn to spray paint. You don't have an unlimited supply. Come on, we just went over how expensive paint is. This stuff isn't free. You instead pick up paint on the streets. Ah, uh, do I have to research theft charges as now? No, 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 I'm just not. I'm just not gonna get into it. A yellow paint can nets you one spray, a blue one will give you five sprays, and the red ones will heal your health. And trust me, you are going to want these. As established, all the things you impose your graffiti on can range from a single spray to many. This encourages you not only to focus on evading arrest, but also keeping a steady supply of paint to make sure that you have enough for the level, making it a fairly strategic experience. On top of that, you have a few other factors to consider while trying to accomplish the main objective of trying to spray graffiti. One of these extra objectives is the point system. Now, honestly, points don't really do that much for you. They're more intrinsic than extra. Extrinsic. You get them by not just spraying graffiti, but by stringing together long combos of specific control stick movements on the art that requires them. Each character has a different control stick pattern and the rhythm for spraying the graffiti, along with having their own unique stats, but we'll get to the characters more in depth later on. The points are tallied at the end of each level to show you a specific ranking, making this game in itself quite replayable. The highest ranking, the jet rankings, do unlock new characters, which, you know, I'm totally not showing footage of that due to, due to spoilers, and not because I'm so bad at this game, I can't get a single jet accomplishment. You, you guys can thank me later, I got you. Throughout the levels, there are collectibles if you need a little distraction. I mean, of course there are. It was legally mandated by the president at the time that all 3D platformers must have some sort of external collectible in it. Yeah, Mario 64 was literally banned by President Clinton, and that's why we have blue coins in Mario Sunshine. Don't fact check this, just trust me. These collectibles will reward you with different graffiti designs you can end up using in the actual gameplay, giving the player a sense of collectability, and honestly, a really satisfying reward. It's much more rewarding than some games where the collectibles kinda just do nothing for you. Each one has a substantial impact and unique value for going out of your way to collect them. And speaking of the graffiti, you can also create your own designs with an in-game painting tool. This is surprisingly in-depth, and you can even make your own graffiti in three sizes of small, medium, and large. That course bond with the graffiti sizes in the game. The graffiti creator works really well, I think, because for one, it lets you enter your own text and fonts. Because let me tell you, if I had to be the one to draw the letters, it would likely come out like a kindergartner's work because I have no artistic talent. I still tried to make my own graffiti and it sucked, 
you could even connect your Dreamcast to the internet and download other users' designs, which nowadays doesn't seem all that grand, but in 2000, don't lie, it would have blown your mind away. I I'm just glad this didn't come out nowadays because we all know what would happen if this game existed. You know it would be inevitable. I also would hope this would be moderated. I couldn't find much research about it, but hopefully this wasn't as much of a Wild West as I am concerned it would be. Let's just, let's just leave it at that. Actually, the internet connectivity was a lot more than just uploading graffiti, too. It contained a newsletter for the game, updating people on the graffiti competition, for example, and also teaching users tips and tricks about the game if you want to be a cheating rebel. Okay, this is actually super cool. Nowadays, though, you never see something like this in a game. You would just look it up on IGN or YouTube. D okay, no one uses IGN, actually. <laughs> I just aged myself. Which makes this game even more of a product of its time. Now, if you need help with a game, you can just get yelled at by some jerk on Reddit. Why is everyone on Reddit so mean all the time? Going back to the concept of points, the fact that you can connect online to discuss the gameplay, as well as seeing a worldwide leaderboard for them, I think makes the point system all the more valuable. It built an online community for this game, in a sense, people could sit down and work together to optimize this game as much as possible. So as much as this website reeks of the early 2000s, it was actually crazy ahead of its time, as to this day, people will work to speedrun and optimize video games in online communities. Getting back to the gameplay, there is one final aspect aspect of these levels to be kind of concerned about being the time limit. Now look, I don't love that there's a time limit here, but it's not the worst feature this game could have. I just think it makes things a little more annoying on your first playthrough when A, you aren't used to the controls yet, and B, don't know where to go. I don't know what it is, but I at least didn't find this game easy in the slightest. I struggled a lot. I did a lot of research and found out that lots of people don't consider this game to be that hard, meaning it was probably on me, but there are some that really struggle with controls, and unfortunately I never really got a perfect grasp on them, although I did get better as the game went on. It puts me in kind of a weird position because I don't really know what to say about them objectively. I, I think at the least it could be agreed upon by hardcore fans and casual players alike that the controls require a decent learning curve to really master. To be fair to the game, I think they do a great job at expanding the player's horizon and improving their skill set with the in-game challenges. There are already the aforementioned tutorial levels that start the game, but throughout the game also there are challenges from other characters. If you win, this character will join your roster. There are usually two types of challenges. One is a copy every move that I'm doing, which I personally think are the ones that are most valuable to the player. It's where you can learn specific moves and combos, some of which are actually helpful in levels, which, while challenging if you're bad at controls like me, will at least provide you some means to get better. I really like these, however, the other type of challenge I am not a fan of. These are the challenges where you have to race someone or follow someone's path for an extended amount of time. If you fail a copy my moves challenge, you can restart them immediately, but there's no easy way to reset a race. I found this to be frustrating because, to me, these were very trial and error. If you fall too far behind, you kind of just know when you're not going to be able to make it, so you either have to hope in vain you can make it to your destination, or just sit around and wait to reset. I wasn't irritated to lose necessarily, I was irritated that I didn't have an efficient way to start over. The one in Chapter 2 particularly, where you have to chase beat, really pissed me off, specifically due to a jump on a staircase that they put on a ramp, so sometimes you just do a ramp jump and more or less instantly lose. I lost to this countless times and had to wait a few minutes to get back, but to the game's credit, most of the time when I failed in the other challenges, it was due to my own lack of mastery of the controls. There's not a lot of, well that's BS moments in this game. This specific mission is one of the very few where I felt that. I mean, come on, am I the only one who struggled with this? Ultimately, the controls of Jet Set Radio are the type of controls that require you to sit down and try to get good at. If you want to improve at the game, you definitely can, but be prepared to really settle in and practice. My final conclusion is that the controls aren't inherently bad for that reason, just something that I, and hopefully some others, so I'm not alone on this, struggle with if you are new to the game. However, there are a few genuine control quirks to be aware of. At least regarding the Dreamcast version, there isn't a second control stick for the camera, all you have in terms of camera control is the L trigger, which centers it behind you, reminiscent of other games at the time. Now keep in mind, this is the same button that you use to spray paint. These two don't always overlap, but in some of the final stages of the game, there are a lot more green arrow graffitis which you don't have to spray, as they only reward you with points, but often I found myself spraying these instead of centering the camera by accident, which would not only waste precious spray paint, but leave my 
myself susceptible to enemy attacks, and I didn't care about the points. It's a pretty nonsensical design flaw when you consider the Dreamcast has, you know, buttons that don't go used. But because this is only an issue on one of the last levels, it's something I can at least accept about the game. It's not an overarching problem, it's just a little annoyance. Other than that, I don't think the controls are inherently bad, just something that, again, requires your time and effort to get good at. And I think the key to getting good is learning how to build and maintain speed and momentum. This isn't always the easiest to build up. I think my biggest challenge with this game was not that I couldn't necessarily build speed, but often I would entirely miss ramps or grind rails, which I needed, due to the slippery joystick controls. I think when Jet Set Radio tries to be a platformer, which it does kinda, this game starts to suffer a bit as a result of that. There isn't a great amount of precision, but again, moments that do require precision end up holding back your ability to successfully build speed. On the other hand, if you find yourself doing an awkward jump to get somewhere, chances are there probably is a better way to approach it and you just don't know it yet. This game does have elements that make it legitimately difficult, though. When a level begins, there are very few goons trying to attack you, but halfway through the required tags on any given level, the amount of enemies sent after you is exponentially raised. I do think this action gets a bit chaotic sometimes, but in a very fun way. But what can be super frustrating is when you have to spray a wall that requires a lot of paint, but you just end up getting attacked over and over by the enemies flooding in. I'm not really sure what the game wants me to do here, like you can sort of fight back, but am I supposed to just let this be and spray paint other walls? It feels a bit unclear and makes me feel a bit helpless when it happens. Okay, I had no clue where to place this in the video, but this needed to be mentioned, one, because it's like sort of relevant to a review, and two, because I just... I just felt like I needed to tell someone about this. <laughs> Throughout the world, there are paths you can go down that take you back to the main menu. I don't really get the point of this, and you can just pause and exit. Y you think this would be inconsequential? It mostly is. But occasionally, I would exit the damn town by accident, and on one extreme occasion, a car crashed into me. I couldn't get off of it, and it pushed me back to the main menu, and I had to start the mission over, okay? Like, I just, I don't know, I just had to get that off my chest, I'm sorry. Speaking of the menus, this is where you can see a map of the level showing the graffiti and how many boards you have left to spray. It's a tad annoying to have to be constantly pausing for it. To be fair to the map itself, it's, it's fairly accurate, although it doesn't account for altitudes. The issue I have with this is it's just not a nice way to have to see it since you always have to be pausing on and off. In a sense, you gotta give it some leniency since games like Grand Theft Auto, which would innovate the having a map on the screen concept, weren't really a thing yet. And it also doesn't hurt to have to pause that much sometimes, it's actually kind of a nice break. Also, if you get good, you shouldn't even need it, it's something the game clearly wants from the player, so in a sense, it's not a requirement, just something that kind of can help you. In Chapter 1, there are two missions introduced. One is to spray the heck out of the town, and the other missions include chasing down gang members and assaulting them with spray paint. These secondary missions are pretty difficult and require a good grasp on the controls and physics. Often the opposing gang will hang out in a corner, which you think would be a time you could conveniently rack up sprays, but unfortunately they seem to have a bit of invincibility here and hit you instead and use this ramp to take off. You need to build up a substantial amount of speed and momentum to effectively take them down. And while these aren't unfair, they do take a decent amount of skill to catch up to. One thing you can do with these different level types is take advantage of the fact that each character is unique in this game, kinda. Each member of the GGs has different stats, meaning that a character you might choose for a chase mission could be a totally different beast than a character you would use for a level where you're building up points. The statistics aren't inherently clear what they mean at first, there's power, technique, and graffiti. Power is just a word for health bar, but all the higher technique and graffiti statistics mean is you'll get more overall points for your movement. And keep in mind, the higher your graffiti statistic is, the harder performing the graffiti will be. It's not just free points. So just keep that in mind if you don't care about the point system. I say that the characters are only kind of unique because they don't end up having a ton of differences in terms of physics or speed, something I think could have been a real factor here to make chase levels a bit more manageable and also just provide more variety to picking characters. As such, I would always just play as characters with the most health because I felt like they would give me a greater chance at getting through the level and I didn't care too much about points. But for those trying to rack up your high scores, these characters are extremely beneficial to maxing out this score, and you can unlock better ones by getting jet ranks on each level as mentioned earlier.
Each level presents itself with substantial replayability because of this, and Jet Set Radio, I think, creates the perfect balance between being an arcade game and being an action story type of game. I think everyone's playstyle is accounted for here, as a result, something that other Sega games weren't usually able to accomplish. Sonic is definitely more of a single player experience, although it started to tack on ranked missions down the line. Super Monkey Ball started out very arcade-like, even a game like Crazy Taxi is purely an arcade experience. Jet Set Radio fits the perfect middle ground though, it's not just a game that's enjoyable to play, but also to replay over and over again. The first chapter is by far the longest part of this game. There are a lot of missions here. Throughout each mission, there are many cutscenes from the local DJ, Professor K, speaking through the in-game radio system, where he tells a breakdown of events of the story, explaining exactly what is happening to not only the in-game characters, but you. DJ K has a ton of charm to him and is very much a fan favorite of the series and possibly Sega as a whole. But of course, the DJ doesn't just talk. This isn't your typical 10 a.m. podcast that three people listen to. He's also responsible for the music that's heard throughout the game. And while I've already talked about the graphics in this game and the impact on its legacy, the soundtrack is one of the best and probably most memorable parts of Jet Set Radio. These include a few songs made for the game specifically, but also a handful of licensed tracks. The songs in this game are quite trippy, but add a ton to the presentation and are really enjoyable to listen to both on and off playing this game. I highly recommend even if you don't play this game that you listen to the soundtrack if you're curious or just want to expand your music horizons. This complements the visual style and general theme of the game so well and it's a huge contributor to this game being remembered and cherished the way it is to this very day. Chapter 2 is the chapter with the exclusive content made for the North America and PAL versions. It contains levels that are themed around cities in New York. And look at what Japan thinks of us. Pornos on the wall, burger joints wherever you go, shameless advertising. Ugh. Okay, they, they, they kind of nailed it, but I, I'm still offended. This chapter is by far the shortest and contains sort of a mini plot from new characters, Combo and Cube, who come to you wanting to join your gang for your help. I appreciate how these characters are introduced. You get to play as them immediately and see the story from their perspective for a little bit. This chapter has two mini missions of following Gum and Beat in the challenge levels, and then only two main levels. The first main level is kind of generic, and it feels like one of the least flushed out levels in the entire game. Apparently this is supposed to be based around Gotham, but I don't know. It doesn't feel that Gotham-like to me. It also has these BS graffiti spots where you gotta get super high on the wall to hit them. These are throughout the game, but here there's like five on one wall, and you have a team of people trying to murder you at any given moment with like sticks and whips. And good luck trying to get these if you're bad in the game like I am. The second of these two levels I found to be one of the hardest in the entire game. It looks super cool, and it's a great adaptation of New York City, but for some reason I struggled so much for this level. You have to ride these damn elevators up and, and jump from building to building like, like Spider-Man or something, except you're on a skateboard. And I did some research on this level and no one struggled with it as much as I did. So if anyone else died a million times here, can you like please comment on this video so I feel a little, a little better about myself? Like I'm not gonna take points away from the game because I'm bad at it, but seriously, oh my God, I, I just couldn't do this level. My least favorite part is when you're on top of a building and trying to do graffiti, but get shot and knocked off the tower due to Castlevania level pushback and then have to climb all the way back up. Chapter 3, the final act of this game, is more or less a remix of Act 1, with a city now under threat from a new gang, the Rokoku Gang. Rokoku Gang? Rokaku? Rokaku. The Rokaku Gang, who are hunting the streets to find a record that can summon an ancient demon. You know, I thought my grandma was exaggerating when she said rock and roll was the spawn of Satan but she could have just played Jet Set Radio. It takes the levels you played in Act 1, but links them together and adds extra hazards or different graffiti locations. While it's perhaps a bit disappointing there isn't too much new here, I think these levels are still rewarding and some of the best in the entire game. There's a few more chase levels here as well, one of which was quite easy and the other gave me a migraine because it was another altitude level. But for the sake of not getting too repetitive, I actually don't have a lot to say about Chapter 3. Like, I didn't take that many notes because it's chapter one, it's just harder and more drawn out. There aren't any new gameplay devices, and how you take that depends on if you like this game or not. I liked Act 1, so I liked Act 3. I assume someone who didn't like Act 1 probably wouldn't turn around towards the end. The final boss, named Goji, the CEO of Rokoku, is probably one of the easiest parts of this third act. 
I don't know, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't like the section too much. There are four platforms linked together, two of which require you to grind a rail. The other two require precision platforming, which is something that this game doesn't do well, because your character moves frequently with too much momentum. I always would fall off these platforms. <laughs> I might have just been doing it wrong, but I found these jumps to be irritating and by far my biggest difficulty here. Final hit of this fight requires you to get a lot of speed to do a precise jump to graffiti Goji one final time. And I do think while this platforming part is kind of bullshit. It's a perfect culmination in the game. A mastery of everything is required. You need platforming skills, you need grind skills, the efficiency of your graffiti on the pillars so you don't get attacked, and a final and precise grind to end it off. And while I definitely had my fair share of deep frustrations with this game, I just want to say Jet Set Radio is a great game, and any complaints I had don't really ruin it for me in any way. Well, I don't think the controls age perfectly, and there are a lot of quirks and questionable game design decisions, it's a good game for those who want to get good at it. While sales of this game didn't end up being abysmal, I don't think it was the success Sega expected. You know, it was on the Dreamcast, so it makes sense that it didn't sell that well. So, what would happen if you put this game on a console that did sell well? How about a Nintendo console? Well, guess what? That did happen in 2003 just not on the Nintendo console you would expect. It's a great idea, right? Porting Jet Set Radio to another console with the GameCube controller. You would think the GameCube would be an obvious choice for something like this. It has cartoony and beautiful games like Wind Waker. It has a great controller. This game would fit right at home. Nope, they ported this to the f***ing Game Boy Advance. Nothing in my life makes sense anymore. Like, really? The Game Boy Advance, like, why? This is like Super Monkey Ball Jr. all over again. But the most mysterious part of this port is that no one really talks about it, to the point where the Wikipedia page doesn't even say this is the final release in the series. And I think in part, it's not acknowledged as a Jet Set Radio entry because this game isn't unique, it doesn't have its own identity, and of course it just bears the same name, despite being a referred to as Jet Set Radio Advance. So I think a lot of people just consider it a port, and it kind of is, but it's tough for me to say it's fully a port because, well, I don't know, compare these two games side by side and tell me these aren't different games. Technically, it does meet the description of a port. It's, it's more like a demake, I guess. So I will accept it as one of those for the sake of this review. And yeah, there are the same levels, same characters, same story, same tutorial, even some of the same unlicensed songs make it over, which while very compressed, it's still neat. So yeah, it's kind of fair people ignore this game, but at the same time, it kind of blows my mind there's at least sort of a Jet Set Radio game pretty much no one talks about. And it could have been a really good clickbait title in video too, but who would do something like that? Jet Set Radio Advance was released in 2003 and ported by Vicarious Visions, who were responsible responsible for porting the Tony Hawk games to the Game Boy Advance. There isn't too much information on the development of this game either, so I can't even begin to tell you why or how this game came to be. And you know, even if there was information, I still don't think I would really understand why. <laughs> and I don't think it sold that well either. Now, my source here may not be entirely accurate, but the literal only information on sales I could find for this port was a poopy little graph on the VG Charts website, which says that this game sold 30,000 copies. I get that VG Charts isn't the most accurate, but there's no other information I could find on it. So I'm going with this, even if it's not correct. I don't think this game was a success, but I think this time around it's, it's, it's a bit more warranted. To be positive for a moment, the game looks really good for a Game Boy Advance game. It has previously mentioned bits of the songs. It's faithful for a Game Boy Advance game, but there's just one problem. A at least in my opinion, it doesn't control well at all. They tried too hard to be like the original game, and I think they would have just been better off trying to make a 2D side-scroller or something of the sort that uses similar assets. We see this in some type of movie games, like when they make a Game Boy Advance port, you get the 3D one on console, and then the Game Boy Advance port is just kind of like a cheaper, easier side-scroller. But here they were just like, nah, do whatever it takes, put that game on a Game Boy Advance. But yeah, the controls are tremendously awkward, to me at least. It it's apparently the same control scheme as the GBA Tony Hawk games, which I guess some fans say ends up working well, so I imagine that you could get good at this game if you put the time in, but at least as a casual player who doesn't care for these type of games, I think this control scheme is, is horrible, honestly. But yeah, I don't have a ton to say about it. It's Jet Set Radio, but downgraded. There really is no reason to play this game over the Dreamcast version. In fact, that's probably why it died to history. It's not unique. 
just that radio on GBA doesn't have its own identity. And listen, if this is the lowest point that this series has as a game, it's fine. I mean, there was also a mobile game. This is mostly lost media, so there isn't a ton to say about this one. There's only a few screenshots out there, but don't tell me that typing jet isn't the reason you clicked on this video. I mean, look at this great game. Typing Jet was released on the Japanese exclusive J phones, which let's be kind to it. It's a phone that looks like crap nowadays, and we have phones better than computers. And at the time, this was cool. There's a, there's a, there's a camera and 256 colors. Yeah, these things kind of suck. Sega were always known for releasing mobile games on these handheld consoles, and always have seemed to embrace phones in all of their forms. Beloved series such as Sonic, Super Monkey Ball, and Puyo Puyo would find their way to these early mobile phones. So it's not that much of a reach that Jet Set Radio would find its way in some form as well. But just like the GBA version, no one really seemed to care. I mean, it, it probably was cared about even less. Judging by these few screenshots, you would type something and then Jet would do tricks. I don't know, it's, it's tough to review a game you don't see gameplay of and you, you don't know anything about. Like, it's kind of a challenge. But I think for a crappy phone, it's a fine enough product. I don't know, what do you expect me to say about it? I just thought it was cool that it exists, like I had to talk about it. Of course though, while Jet Set Radio had these mini titles on other platforms, it would go on to receive an entire full-fledged sequel on the original Xbox. This time around, the Jet Set name was the standard, retiring the Jet Grind name in North America for this title. Jet Set Radio Future was not a sequel, necessarily. It was actually supposed to be like a remake or reimagining of the first game, kinda. I don't know. You gotta hand it to Sega. Some franchises take 30 years to be revived, but here, boom, let's redo it. It's been two years. It really is futuristic. Jet Set Radio Future is a reimagining of the first game. It's a really good game. Probably one of the best the original Xbox even has to offer. I mean, it's one of three exclusive on this console that isn't just a shooter or a really grim game. I searched far and wide to see the development history of this game. There really isn't too much out there on this one. I guess this game kind of just happened, but I don't know. It's a good game. It retells more or less of the same story as the first, with most of the same characters returning. This time around, you start the game not as Beat, but as Yo-Yo, who was in the first game as well. It's important to keep in mind that the story doesn't maintain any continuity from the first game, so it doesn't acknowledge anything that happened in the Dreamcast title, which is why it's able to retread as much as it does. The gangs from the first game appear as well. Also, this game takes place in 2024, only two years after society currently. And see, this is why if you make a game in the future, you say that it takes place in the year 3000, because who cares? We'll all be dead. But now we know that they were wrong with this game, because look at how unrealistic it is. They aren't even wearing masks. While the general's gameplay of skating around the returning Tokyo Toe and spraying graffiti persists, the time limit system is now entirely gone. The gameplay in general focuses a bit more on grind rails and the trick system. This is always what Sega's focus in North America was with the Jet Set series, even though the game wasn't meant to be a competitor to Tony Hawk or something of the sort. So patching that in the sequel kind of seemed like an inevitable feature. The world is accessed via a hub world now instead of a map selection screen. This hub world is something I really wish the first game had, because you kind of had to learn to play the game and the levels themselves. There was very little time for experimentation or trying to get good. But now you can improve and practice in a much more convenient fashion. Time limit being gone and the world generally being bigger as well does shift the gameplay quite a lot from a less of a stressful chase and run game to something that feels more like a straight up skating experience, with the trick system again being expanded upon. As mentioned, it resembles something you would see from Tony Hawk but it's a bit easier and way less stressful. There are less enemies because of the open world too. Of course, the chase levels return as well, but because of the better controls, they also fare a bit better than the first time around. A lot of the levels seem heavily inspired by the first game, maybe a little darker in style. It really is just more or less a reimagining of the original. Same graphics, same plot, same general ideas, same type of levels. It's not one for one or anything, but it's ultimately similar, but better. Just that Radio Future is a great game. It might not be as fresh as the originals, but it was a great sequel. I invested many hours into this game, and it's probably my favorite game on the original Xbox, with better graphics, a better soundtrack, positive reviews. The future of Jet Set Radio seemed brighter than ever, right? Well, Jet Set Radio Future was a commercial failure, and probably what killed the series. Well, we talked about it out of order. The GBA port did come after this, but of course that was just more or less a demake, and after that things were definitely quiet, and by quiet I mean I mean dead. <laughs>
Jet Set Radio Future was the second and final big title in the series. It sold very poorly and tanked in Japan. It should be noted that it would eventually get re-released along Sega GT 2002, but this version of the game would only be bundled with the consoles and wasn't sold individually. As talked about earlier, it doesn't matter how good of a game a series is. If it sells bad, just forget it, and sales here killed off a really amazing franchise. But Jet Set Radio continues to live on in some ways and has a cult following that persists to this very day. While doing research for this video, I found the Reddit, which is surprisingly active. There's a lot of people making fan arts, and I just kind of wanted to shout them out because it's a really active and passionate community. And that's only a small example. I mean, there's still YouTube videos and all the other things. Concepts of a new entry would continue to be brought up throughout the following years. A pitch for a new game in the series for the Nintendo Wii was shown to Sega, but Sega pretty much said, get that the hell away from me or I'm calling the police. In 2017, again, someone pitched a Jet Set Radio game with a really vibrant art style, something that looks like it would fit in well on the Switch or something, but uh, Sega just doesn't want anything to do with this franchise at this point. And I think people are starting to realize that a bit, maybe. And while fans definitely have the complete right to be disappointed by this, including myself, it's hard not to feel some level of empathy for Sega. A video game costs a lot to make, and if the game doesn't sell well, it's a big risk. While it sucks to see Sonic continue with mediocre entries, maybe, if there's any silver lining to this, the Jet Set Radio series will be positively remembered and not ever be a series that jumps the shark or has a bad game, keeping it kind of in a positive state forever. What is comforting, at least, is that Sega hasn't completely forgotten about the franchise. In 2012, a remaster would come to the HD consoles at the time, bringing Jet Set Radio to a completely new generation of consoles and gamers. This remaster would add a better camera with the second control stick, thank god, and ultimately added a bit more content, basically just combining the soundtracks from the regions for ones and had achievements and a few other goodies. Sega even did another contest for it, this time it was just online, so honestly not as cool, but it's still something that exists and shows a bit of excitement from the company still. The HD remaster is the definitive way to play this game due to all the upgraded features, and we can only hope that this game being a mostly good experience on modern consoles would only enhance the legacy of the franchise and maybe spark some more interest in a future for the franchise. Okay, I said mostly good experience, let's talk about the iOS and Android version. Why does Sega, why, why, why does Sega port this game to consoles that just shouldn't play Jet Set Radio? Like, leave the handhelds alone, this is abusive. Like, you guys invest all that money to put it on the Game Boy Advance or iOS and they run like a but you won't port it to the Wii or GameCube or anything, I don't know, that might actually make it successful? Why not the Switch? Yeah, this looks miserable. You can't really play it because they took it off the App Store, but I, I could barely get used to the controls on the Dreamcast, so I can't even imagine how miserable this feels. But okay, Jet Set Radio Remaster was ultimately a success. Just not on phones. Jet Set Radio would also continue to become a somewhat familiar and recurring character in the Sega Superstars Tennis and Sega Superstars Racing and Racing Transform games. And in Super Monkey Ball Banana Mania, Beat was added as a character, turning the bananas into spray paint cans as well. Okay, this is a little silly to look at, but it's kind of cute. And again, it shows Sega has some passion left for this series. It's actually a really novel cameo. Sega finally recently mentioned this game as a possible dormant franchise that could be brought back at some point. And we can only hope. There have been a lot of Sega franchises that have crawled out of their grave. Shenmue came back for its third installment. Super Monkey Ball had a huge revival in the past few years. Even games like Panzer Dragoon have crawled out of their hole. Only time can tell if Jet Set Radio will have a future, but even if it doesn't, we live in the era of Kickstarters and fans who will take this type of thing into their own hands. Recently, a spiritual successor, Bomb Rush Cyberfun, was revealed and subsequently funded. Okay, this is heavily inspired by Jet Set Radio. I mean, look at it. But even this feels a lot for a spiritual successor. That being said, I do think it's awesome that fans have taken it into their own hands. And because this franchise really hasn't had that long of an existence, more of the same is probably needed to A, introduce it to a new generation, and B, just get it to a status quo. Like, you don't want to do anything too experimental. I get it. And that's more or less a complete coverage of the Jet Set Radio franchise. There are definitely things I missed or possibly skimmed over. I didn't talk about future as much as I could have, but this video is long and I didn't want to go beyond the scope of what it was supposed to be. There was ultimately a lot to cover, so if I missed something you cared about deeply, I apologize, but this video was a massive undertaking and again, I just wanted to make sure the scope of this video remained to talk about the history and legacy of what it was. 
Jet Set Radio, even if it's not revived by Sega, is never going to be dead. It's hard to imagine that the developers would even have the same spunk or energy they did when they created the first games. It has been 20 years after all. But I think more than ever, Jet Set Radio needs to exist again. Topics like police brutality and teenage rebellion are talked about more than ever. In a series that is not only remembered for its fantastic games, but speaks about a moment in time of a society or gems that turn video games from less of a commercial product into more of an art. And Jet Set Radio Radio is a unique, creative, and fun game second, because firstly, it's just that, a fantastic piece of art. Mm -hmm.